Would you like to know more about how pharma manufacturing works? Every month, we bring you an insider conversation with our experts here at Lonza, with our partners and leaders in the industry. Hi, my name is Martina Hesteritsova, and this is A View On, a podcast brought to you by Lonza. Welcome. I hope that you enjoyed your summer break as much as we did. We are now back with the second season of A View On, and I promise you it's fully packed with exciting science and technology updates. Let's begin with the first one. There are over 1 million known vertebrate viruses, out of which a third are known to infect mammalian cells. That includes human cells. They do so by penetrating the cellular membrane and by releasing the viral genetic information, RNA or DNA, into the host cell. The cytotoxic effect of viruses is usually connected to their pathogenicity. However, it is well possible to harness this activity for therapeutic purposes. Virus-based therapies take advantage of the amazing cell activity they possess. This is of great value because chemo and radiotherapy often have the high toxicity and off-target activity levels, meaning that they also harm healthy cells and cause side effects. To talk more about the great potential of oncolytic viruses, we are joined by Imad Mardini, the Chief Operating Officer, as well as Professor Ghassan Alusi, the founder and chairman of Cyvac. Cyvac is a preclinical biotech company pioneering the next generation of oncolytic virus therapy to improve the treatment of patients with cancer. Welcome both and thanks for joining us today. Hi, Martina. Thanks for having us. Hi, Martina. Thank you very much indeed for having us. It's a pleasure. So, Gassan, would you mind explaining who you are and what you do at Cyvac? Yeah, I'm uh, an ear, nose and throat surgeon uh, and a head and neck cancer surgeon. I'm based here in London uh, at Barts Health and I do my cancer surgery at University College Hospitals. We started uh, work on our oncolytic viruses a number of years ago, but we started our first biotech company, Exogen, in 2010. 11. I then started working with my colleagues and with the patent uh, lawyers to apply for patents for our oncolytic virus. And when we finally got these patents around two years ago, mainly for US, uh, Japan, China, India, more recently, uh, we started the drive towards fundraising, creating Cyvac uh, for the fundraising, and also uh, collaborating with Lonza on the manufacturing process. Although I'm a, a surgeon, actually, I've always been driven by academia and uh, cutting-edge research. In the 90s, I did a PhD on using augmented reality for skull-based surgery, for example. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, and augmented reality is only now becoming a, a realistic prospect for uh, surgery. At the time, it was a very new field and very few people even had heard of uh, augmented reality. When I uh, finished PhD and eventually became a consultant surgeon at the end of my training, this is uh, about 20 years ago, I wanted to continue the theme of finding cutting edge technology to improve surgical outcome. I wanted to go into lab-based research as I felt that uh, we had really had to go back to basic science research to start to make some new advances. Uh, and indeed, even though we've had amazing advances in chemotherapy and radiotherapy and more recently in, in immunotherapy, which we'll talk about very soon, uh, there remained a field which fascinated me, which was oncolytic virus therapy it was in its early stages of development uh, 20 years ago. And that's when I started to work with basic scientists on finding out a little more and understanding what happens in oncolytic virus therapy. And it wasn't really till 2015 that we had the first FDA approved oncolytic viral therapy in the name of Imlegic for the treatment of uh, advanced stage malignant melanoma. So... How about the history? Oncolytic properties of viruses have been known for over a century now. Why is it important to focus on this research now? 
We've known about the link between cancer regression and viral infections since the beginning of the 20th century. There have been cases reported in lymphoma and in cervical cancers, amongst others. And in these patients, cancers regressed after the patient had an unrelated viral infection. The first time that a virus was shown to be oncolytic was in 1922, when vaccinia virus was shown to inhibit growth tumors in mice and rats. This was the first demonstration of viral oncolysis in the laboratory. Actually, coordinated research efforts did not begin until the 60s. Uh, that's uh, when the technology to create a custom virus was beginning to be understood, but yet uh, not available. Now that the technologies of other forms of immunotherapy are gaining ground, and as cancer, despite all advances, remains a major cause of mortality, we now understand that there is a huge need for oncolytic viral therapy. Thanks, Gassan. And what's your take on this, Imad? Well, it's a very valid point you raised. Um, oncolytic viruses have been around effectively for a long time, dating back from studies carried out in the 1950s. Uh, and one particular study which uh, st- kind of sticks in my mind, which really shows the power of immunotherapy using the adenovirus wild type and the treatment of carcinoma of the cervix, whereby nine patients at the time showed clinical evidence of widely disseminated cancer. And to be honest, it's only as recent as 2015, um, when Amgen bought Biovex for a total deal value of about $1 billion uh, after receiving FDA approval for malignant melanoma using a herpes virus. Uh, that kind of kicked off the whole revolution in immunotherapy. And we're now seeing pretty much close to 80 clinical trials that are ongoing in oncolytic viruses. So the trend effectively is moving towards the immunotherapy treatment uh, in fighting cancers. And I believe we will soon see the end of days of evasive surgeries, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and essentially working with the immune immune system, harnessing its power uh, to, to tackle cancer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And could you help me understand what happens with the virus once it is injected into the tumor? How can you control the dose if the virus replicates itself constantly? How how can you stop the process? The oncolytic virus uh, enters the cancer cell and it is able to replicate within that cancer cell and create multiple copies of itself. The virus will then break down the cell. That causes a release of lots of new antigens that the immune system had not been able to see. It also releases thousands, tens of thousands of copies of itself that would then uh, go on to infect other cancer cells. And this cycle goes on until either the immune system shuts down the viral infection or until the cells themselves start to develop a mechanism of shutting down new infections or preventing the virus from replicating. Generally, if you're not uh, immune suppressed or uh, have other underlying conditions, and and the body is able to cope with within a couple of days, it mounts an immune response and it shuts everything down. In cancer cells, that these mechanisms are deranged because these cells are extensively mutated and they keep releasing, uh, uh, keep changing in their genome as they replicate. And the effect that you speak of, which is the oncolytic effect, in our particular virus, seems to be agnostic, seems to work on every single tumor cell line that we've tested. We've tested 18 of them now, and we are continuing to do our preclinical work in more cancer cell lines and to try and progress our understanding of how powerful this uh, virus that we have is. You mentioned that this works in, or it has been tested in 18 cell lines of cancer. Is this approach limited to solid tumors or could it be extended also to liquid tumors? We have not looked at any of the liquid tumors yet. We haven't done a single one yet. Uh, We have future work uh, to look at that. This oncolytic effect, this ability to break down cancer cells, you have to remember is only one aspect of how an oncolytic virus works. The other 
aspect which is extremely important, as important, is that when the virus infects these tumor cells, danger signals are released. The immune system is then attracted to the presence of the virus. So effectively, you have an immunity mounted against these antigens, a principle, of course, that uh, has been used uh, in CAR T-cell technology. So our understanding of the immune system and how it works is absolutely fundamental to continuing to uh, understand how oncotic viruses attract and use the immune system to attack cancer cells elsewhere. You mentioned CAR T cells. I wonder how does the manufacturing compare between oncolytic viruses and, say, CAR T cells? CAR T cells is a, a remarkable technology. Fundamentally, a white cell is removed from the patient and then that is primed against one single specific antigen. This single antigen has a single antibody that is directed against it. The way that this antibody is uh, produced on the T cell is actually done by genetically alter altering the cell and then the white cells are expanded and then reintroduced into that patient. So it's patient-centric treatment, uh, and it's shown some fantastic results. And in the more recent uh, second generation CAR T cells, we're seeing other genomes being introduced to enhance the immune response. In essence, that's how CAR T cells work, and that's how they're made. Our virus is uh, fundamentally different in that the process of producing the virus involves using Uh, cell lines, and uh, these cell lines are housed in bioreactors, uh, and this is being done at the moment by uh, scientists uh, at Lonza and Houston, and we've now reached the 50 liter bioreactor level. So it's actually been a very fruitful collaboration with uh, Lonza in a relatively short period of time, partly because of the previous experience that they have in the adenovirus uh, field. Could you help me understand how does the administration work? So once you have the thawed vial that contains the virus, I assume you need to inject it to a tumor. I wonder, can you use virtual or augmented reality to aid you to, to find the right tumor? And also, what is the limit for the tumor size? The first uh, clinical trial that we're about to do uh, will involve only clinically palpable and injectable tumors. So we are taking all different cancer types uh, to go into phase one. We are going to administer the drug to any patient who has a solid tumor that is palpable and that fulfills several other conditions uh, in terms of other treatments in the past and uh, the patient's uh, fitness, etc. And we have a, a limit of the tumor size of uh, no smaller than one centimeter and at the moment, no greater than six centimeters, though that is an arbitrary size. Nobody's ever looked at uh, injecting tumors uh, much bigger than that. That work is yet to be done in, in future clinical trials. At the moment, our primary outcome measure must be establishing the safety and satisfying the regulators that we can go on then to demonstrate efficacy, which is also a, a secondary outcome measure of the phase one, but you'll need much bigger numbers for uh, efficacy to be demonstrated. And now, Imad, perhaps a question for you. Uh, what do you expect in the near future for your treatment? We now heard that you are at the phase one clinical trial stage. I mean, do you expect to move to phase two anytime soon? So right now, we've, uh, we're, we're still, as you know, uh, manufacturing with our strategic partner, Lonza in Houston. And we have recently demonstrated stability, scalability of our product at the 50 liter bioreactor stage. And we are constantly purifying the virus and developing it to enter the next stage, which is the toxicology studies in animals. The clinical manufacturing slot with our strategic partner, Lonza, is scheduled for March next year, after which our product will then be QP released and stored in the UK. So having said that, we would look to initially start our phase one clinical trials uh, in Q3 2022 at the two nominated sites that we have identified here in London, uh, one being the Royal Marsden and the other being uh, UCH in London as well. Wow, that's really soon. That's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is very exciting, yes. <laughs> um, I wonder, 
Are there any other cancer types that can be targeted using these treatments? Absolutely. So um, as you recall, Martina, our virus is administered intratumorally, which effectively allows us to treat any accessible tumor site, primary or metastasis. So the virus, essentially how it works is it's injected into the tumor site and then infect the tumor cells, delivering the DNA into that cell, which takes over essentially the cellular reproductive mechanism to produce tens and thousands of copies of itself. What this does is essentially it produces and presents a strong danger signal, a danger signal to the immune system through the release of cytokines and chemokines. The virus would then lyse the cell, releasing hidden tumor associated antigens, which are now recognized by dendritic cells and therefore priming the immune system, the T cells, to attack and kill any other tumor cells with the same tumor associated antigen not previously recognized by the immune system and the rest of the body. So essentially, all you would need is an, an injection in one site and the virus will, will allow the immune system to detect all other tumor sites with, in, in the body. Yes, we are at the moment looking at including all tumor types. At the moment, we're very optimistic that we're not going to stop at one tumor type, but we'll be going for others. The question for future clinical trials as well relates to the other aspect of immunotherapy, which is using checkpoint inhibitors. And these are strategic decisions that will have to be made based on the uh, signal and the results coming out from the initial trials. That's why I asked also about the augmented reality, whether so at the moment you plan to target tumors which are palpable and are probably on the surface of the skin. But when you go deeper within the body, would this be maybe something you would be interested in in exploring? Yes, indeed. Uh, Uh, with our work at the moment at the Head and Neck Academic Center at University College London, we are working with manufacturers who are using head-up displays for augmented reality to be used in surgery. We're very close to co-localizing those uh, holographic images of the tumor and the scans over the patient uh, using those head-up displays. Uh, I should say this is a collaboration with Microsoft who are supporting this uh, work and all the work is being done in collaboration with UCLH uh, and our academic head neck academic center at University College London. That sounds amazing. I mean, we really do live in the future, huh? Yes, indeed. You should see some of our uh, presentations and our webinars on the latest developments that uh, we are creating at the moment using augmented reality. And is there anything you'd like to add? I would like to say that uh, we feel very happy that we managed to link up with such a big organization for our GMP production. Uh, they have a huge experience in manufacturing and GMP manufacturing of adenoviruses and oncolytic viruses. Uh, they have a huge resource of uh, scientists and technicians that work with them, whom we meet with now twice a week in Texas. And uh, we've looked at a lot of companies before we uh, made a decision on collaborating with Lanza. And I, I feel very optimistic that this is going to result in uh, some excellent results. And so far, everything's been going absolutely spot on and according to plan and better than ever expected with virtually no hiccups. So very impressed, really. That's fantastic. I'm more than happy to hear that. Thanks. Thank you both for joining and for sharing your great experience in oncolytic viruses with us. I think we learned really a lot and we can't wait to see what the future holds for you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And I must say that I personally find the topic of oncolytic viruses utterly fascinating. I mean, it has a life-changing potential for us all. We couldn't have hoped for a better opening of our second season of A View On. I'm already looking forward to welcoming you next month. We will be talking about the importance of horseshoe crabs to drug and vaccine safety. See you in a month. Bye for now. <laughs>